to have everybody back again now for program number three. And uh, for those of you out in television, again, we just want to welcome you to an informal Bible study. And that's all we want it to be, is to learn how to study on your own. And, uh, you know, I don't attack anybody. Uh, I refuse to do that because my approach is, if I can show the truth simply from Scripture, they're going to see the error, and it's working. My goodness, how we get phone call after phone call. I had a pastor call just before we left this morning. He said, Les, I finally see it. And, well, I didn't have to tell him and browbeat him. The Lord just opened his eyes, and he could see it. And so that's been my approach, and hopefully I'll never change from that. All right, we're going to just continue on where we left off in Daniel chapter 7, but we're going to leave it in just a minute and go back and look at some more references with regard to what God is promising here to the nation of Israel as well as the nations of the world once this kingdom becomes a reality. So let's just go back briefly to Daniel chapter 7 and uh, verses 13 and 14 for a kickoff place. <clears throat> in his vision, Daniel saw in the night vision to behold one like the Son of Man, which is the other term for Christ of the New Testament, and he came with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, or before God the Father. And they brought him near before him, and there was given him, that is, God the Son. There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. And that's what we're looking at now for most of the afternoon. That to God the Son was given and promised a kingdom, not just over Israel, but that all people... All nations and languages should serve him. In other words, under this kingship of Jesus of Nazareth. All right, and it would be an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now, we always like to emphasize that there is no time factor given in the Old Testament whatsoever, but when we get to the book of Revelation, it's what? A thousand years. All right, well, now we're not going to doubt Scripture and say, well, now, it can't be forever if Revelation says a thousand years. Because, as we showed in one of our previous programs this afternoon, when you get to chapter 21, what happens after this scenario is destroyed? New heaven, new earth. So I think we're on the right track to feel that somehow or other, I can't explain it, that this thousand-year millennial reign of Christ will go right on into the eternal. And what God does with the people, we'll leave that with Him. You know, I'm getting more and more all the time. I just tell people, well, I can't answer that. We'll just wait till we get there. See? And then we'll find out everything that we think we have to know. So we're showing from the Old Testament again, like we've done many times before, the promises of things pertaining to this kingdom. Well, now we saw in our last program how that Jerusalem will be the capital of it all. Now come back to Isaiah chapter 11, portion of scripture you're all acquainted with. But again, it just shows how that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords <clears throat> is going to rule the planet with absolute authority. He won't need a House of Representatives or a Senate. He won't need a cabinet. He won't need advisors. He's going to be, as God, fully capable of running and ruling this kingdom by himself. All right, Isaiah chapter 11, and we're just going to start at verse 1. Isaiah chapter 11, starting at verse 1. And there shall come forth. Now, you know, you've heard me say it a hundred times over the last years. When the Bible says it shall come to pass or it's going to come, what can we rest on? It's going to happen. Even though it hasn't yet. God isn't through. It's going to happen. See, it's out in front of us. We can see now that it's getting closer and closer. You know... How many of you are watching the daily program in Hebrews? I'm just kind of curious. Oh, my goodness. Well, now you'll know what I'm talking about. I got just a few minutes of it this morning before we had to leave to come up here, but I got just a few minutes. And do you realize that much of what I'm saying back there in 2001, I could have said last week? This morning's program just, just boggled me. I could have said it last week. And you'd never know that that was spoken nine years ago. 
Well, why? Because everything is just coming now to a vortex. What I talked about 10 years ago is now in the same, it's still in the same beam, but now it's getting closer and closer. Well, the same way with all these Old Testament things. Yes, we've talked about them before, but see, we're so much closer now than we were when I taught it maybe a couple, three years ago. But all right, there shall come forth, it's going to happen, a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now we're speaking of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the King, and uh, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Verse 3, it shall make him of quick understanding in the fear or the wisdom of the Lord. He shall not. Now here it comes. Here's going to be how he will rule over this coming earthly kingdom. He will not rule or judge after the sight of his eyes. In other words, now just stop a minute. Whenever there's a big disaster... Whether it's the flood of the Mississippi or whether it's Katrina down in New Orleans, what do they expect the president to do? Well, get off his duff in Washington and get out and see it all firsthand so that he'll know what the problems are, right? This one won't have to. Because through his omnipotent eyes, he'll know everything that's taking place in his kingdom. See? So he won't have to judge or come to conclusions after looking at something. Neither will he make any reproving or make any corrections or so forth after what he's heard. He's going to know what everything. See? He's going to be absolute sovereign king of kings. All right? Then verse 4. With righteousness, see, he will judge the poor. Here's where the Beatitudes come into play. The Beatitudes that were spoken on the Sermon on the Mount will finally become a reality in this thousand-year rule and reign of Christ. All right, so with righteousness, he will judge or rule the poor. He'll reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. That, of course, was done during the tribulation. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. He did that at the end when he got everything ready for the believers to come in. Now, verse 5. Righteousness. No corruption. No cheating someone out of what belongs to them. It will be total righteousness. No sex trade. No liquor trade, no gambling casinos. All that stuff that pertains to the world of Satan will not be present in this kingdom. But righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And then here we come to the animal kingdom. I love this because you all know I love animals. I could read this verse once a day, every day, year in and year out. That the wolf will dwell with the lamb. Now, do you picture these things? I mean, this isn't pie in the sky. It's going to happen. The wild animals are going to cohabit with the domestic animals. The innocent little lamb and the goats and the dogs and the cats and the, everything is going to be perfectly in conformity with each other, in harmony, if I can use that word. And there is no more curse, see? No more carnivorous animals. So the wolf can dwell with the lamb because he's not looking at it for something to eat. And the leopard will lie down with the kid for the same reason. That big cat isn't going to look at a baby goat for his food. And the calf, that is the calf of the domestic cattle as we know them and as Israel knew them. And the young lion and the fatling together. And then in the midst of all that, what? A little child, see? perfect environment. Children can play amongst these, what we call now, wild carnivorous animals. They're all going to be like pets. A little child shall lead them. Now don't forget what he's talking about. The wolf, the leopard, the lion. Little kids are going to be able to play with them, lead them. Gorgeous. Doesn't that give you a thrill? My goodness, it's unbelievable. And then the cow and the bear will feed, that is, together. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall lie down and eat straw like an ox. In other words, it's going to have the digestive system. Instead of needing meat and blood that it gets from killing something, it's going to have a digestive system that will be able to eat 
provender, such as straw and grass and so forth, like an ox. Well, then, uh, verse 9, They'll not hurt nor destroy in all my holy kingdom, for the earth, the whole planet, will be full of the knowledge of the Lord, even as water covers the sea. In other words, God is going to be in such total, total control of this heaven on earth existence. But now this isn't heaven. Like I said at the beginning of the first program this afternoon, this is not heaven heaven. This is an earth with a heaven-like atmosphere. And so don't ever mix the two. Now I'm going to show a little later, maybe not today, but in our next series of four, that uh, we're going to have some kind of a connection with this kingdom, but I no longer feel that the church is going to come back in mass with the Lord's second coming. I used to kind of think that, but not anymore. Now I think we're going to have a connection with it, so, so don't prejudge me until we get there. All right, so here we have another description then of the earth being so perfect as it was before the fall. All right, now then, I think for sake of time, let's just jump all the way up to uh, Zechariah. Zechariah, the next to last book in your Old Testament, chapter 14. And there it is in language as plain as anyone could hope to read it. But now by the time we get to Zechariah, we get a clearer view of the fact that this kingdom cannot come in until the seven years of tribulation are passed first. Now, we made reference to it with the mortgage and so forth. But see, now we've got a, a better description in Zechariah, even than we have back in uh, the prophets and so forth. So let's just turn to Zechariah 14 and begin at verse 1. Zechariah 14 and we'll begin in verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord, which we said earlier, is the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. Now, in other words, now the prophet and God is speaking to the nation of Israel. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem, the whole consortium of the United Nations nations. They will come against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken. The houses rifled. It's going to be awful for the citizens of Jerusalem. Now remember, while this is taking place, where are the remnant of Jews? Out there in a place of protection. We don't know where, but he says out in the mountains. God is going to protect them for these final three and a half years supernaturally. And nothing of the tribulation horrors will touch that remnant of Israel. Which, remember, will be about five million people. That's a good chunk of human beings. And God's going to sustain them for three and a half years. But for anything that's left back there in Jerusalem who were not part of that escaping remnant, it's going to be awful. The city will be taken. The houses rise. The women rape. Half the city will go forth into captivity, and the rest of the people shall not be cut off. All right, then verse 3, when it looks like there's no hope, and Satan and his Antichrist and their hordes of Gentile armies looks like they're taking everything over, then the Lord goes forth. And he fights against those nations who are under the control of Satan and his man Antichrist, remember, and he's going to go forth and fight as he fought in the day of battle. And then after all has been destroyed and defeated, now then he's going to show up in Jerusalem. Verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day after the tribulation horrors have come to an end. And he will stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall separate in the midst thereof toward the east, toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley. And we know from Ezekiel that through that valley will flow a river of fresh water all the way to the Dead Sea, enough to totally heal it, as we see now in, uh, oh, let's see, let's just jump up to verse 8. And it shall be in that day when Christ has returned to Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives has split in two. A river of fresh water flows out from Jerusalem. <clears throat> now verse 8. And it shall be in that day 
that living water, fresh water, shall go out from Jerusalem, half to the former sea, that is, out to the Mediterranean, and half toward the Hinder Sea, or the Dead Sea, which is east of Jerusalem, just a few miles, remember. And in summer and winter it shall be. All right, now here's the verse that I always head for. And the Lord, God the Son, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, in all of his glory, shall be king over all the earth. Now be ready to show your fellow church people. Most of them don't know this. Most of them don't. Now some do, but most of them don't. So be ready. Look what the book says. Our Lord is going to be king over all the earth. Now they like to spiritualize it, you know, and allegorize it. No way. You take it literally. He's going to be king of kings and lord of lords over the whole planet, ruling from Jerusalem. All right, in that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. Well, then, thinking of that river of fresh water, I can't help but think of Ezekiel. So let's come back to Ezekiel just a moment before we go into the New Testament. And I think it's pretty close to the last chapter. Yeah, it is. Chapter 47. And this is another one of the supernatural phenomena of the kingdom. Now, those of you who have been to the Dead Sea or read about it, you know it is so full of salt and minerals that you can't do anything but float in it. And uh, it is by far the saltiest, most mineralized piece of water on all the earth. Even Salt Lake in Utah is nothing compared to the saltiness of the Dead Sea. But all right, look what's going to happen. And uh, chapter 47. We won't take time to read these earlier verses, but he sees a river of water starting out of Jerusalem, and he sees it as it heads out toward the Dead Sea. Oh, let's just jump in at verse 8. Then he said unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country. See, that's where the Dead Sea is from Jerusalem. Down, down, down to the east, and down uh, altitude-wise to a couple thousand feet below sea level. All right, so he said, enter in, or go out toward the east country, go down into the desert, and go on into the sea, which bring, being brought forth into the sea, the water, that is of the Dead Sea, shall be healed. They'll be made like fresh water. Now it's verse 9, and it shall come to pass, it's going to happen, that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. In other words, along the banks of the river, the various trees and the, the herbs and so forth are going to be just growing profusely because it now has access to this beautiful fresh water river. All right? And all the things brought forth into the sea, the waters of the Dead Sea shall be healed. It'll be become a totally freshwater lake. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. There shall be a great multitude of fish. See? Because these waters shall come hither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live with a wither for coming. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi and then Eglim. Now that pops a question, doesn't it? Are we going to eat meat in the kingdom? Now I said we, uh, I mean the people there. I, I'm sure that we're going to be there that full time or not. But anyway, are people going to eat meat during the kingdom? Well, not meat, but evidently they're going to eat fish. Because these fishermen certainly aren't going to catch nets full of fish just to let them rot. So I have to take from this, they're at least going to be eating fish. And we know they're going to eat figs, they're going to eat grapes, they're going to have the fruit and so forth. But evidently, just look what it says. It shall come to pass, verse 10, that the fishermen shall stand upon it from En Gedi even unto En Eglim. There shall be a place to spread forth their nets, their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea exceeding many. So that's just a little tidbit you can think about. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to, but uh, it certainly indicates that that is the prospect. All right, now let's just jump quickly into the New Testament, and uh, I'm going to start with Matthew chapter 5. <coughs> 
Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7, honey. Now Christ has already begun his earthly ministry. I think this is probably part of the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 17. Matthew 5, verse 17. Jesus is speaking. And he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. Well, now the casual reader thinks, well, he must be talking about the cross. No, not yet. That's still future. So what's he talking about? All these promises concerning the kingdom. All these promises of his being a king, and he will bring in the kingdom. Now, lest you think I'm stretching the point, keep your hand in Matthew. I'm not through there. Come all the way up to Acts, chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, and let's drop in at verse 19 first. Because this is Peter, again, preaching to the nation of Israel. In view of this coming kingdom, the king has already been rejected and crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended back to glory. But the whole promise is that he'd be coming back and still be the king over this glorious kingdom. And so that's Peter's uh, basis of his preaching. So verse 19. Well, now I've got to read verse 18. <laughs> verse 18. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, now that he's fulfilled. So repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he, God, will send Jesus Christ to be for, back in the Old Testament, was preached unto you. And what would he come for? To be the king. To set up the kingdom. And so this is Israel's prospect. Especially now on this side of the cross, the blood of atonement has been shed. He's been raised from the dead. He's ascended back to glory. He's seated at the Father's right hand. Psalms 110, verse 1, what did it say? Come sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And what would that be? The tribulation. And then he would come be the king. All right, but now come all the way down through these verses that Peter is using to prepare the Jews for the coming of this king and his kingdom. All right, now verse 25. My, just look at these carefully. Peter is telling the nation of Israel. Now, you want to remember, there's no concept of the Apostle Paul and the gospel of grace. Not a word yet. So all Peter is resting on are these Old Testament promises, and we're going to go back and look at one of them now after this. I have to. But look at verse 25. Peter says, You, the nation of Israel, the Jews of his day, you are the children of the prophets. You are the children of the covenant which God made with our fathers when he said unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. But now look at verse 26. Unto you first, Israel. God, having raised up his son Jesus in resurrection power, remember, sent him to bless you in turning away how many? Every one of you. And see, Christ couldn't come until every Jew had believed who he was, and they didn't. So it was postponed. And then, of course, we go on and we have the rising of the Apostle Paul. But here we have this promise now then of this king waiting in the wings to bring in the kingdom. All right, now if you'll flip back to Matthew chapter 5, maybe that'll help you understand why I think that Jesus isn't speaking yet of the cross. He's speaking of the king and the kingdom which had been promised ever since, well, like we saw Abraham. And then in our last program, we saw Israel was promised everything in the book of Exodus. But read the verse again. Think not 
that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He is coming to bring in the kingdom to Israel. All right, now I forgot and I skipped back in Isaiah. So come back with me because we don't want to leave it out completely. Come back with me to Isaiah 42. <clears throat> Isaiah 42. Because we got to pick up the fact that God hasn't forgotten about the non-Jewish world, which we call Gentiles. Isaiah 42, dropping in at verse 1. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Oh, good heavens, that half hour's gone. Do you know that? Oh, boy, they go fast. Are you ready, honey? Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. Now remember, God is writing or speaking through Isaiah the prophet as he writes to the children of Israel. All right? I have put my spirit upon him, it's a person, and he shall bring forth judgment or rule to the Gentile. Who are we talking about? God the Son, the Messiah, see? And he's going to rule over Gentiles. Well, what have we been saying all the way along? It's not going to be just a king over Israel. He's going to be the king of the whole planet. Every nation that is on the world today, I feel, will have enough survivors to begin every new nation in the kingdom that we have on the world today. That'll be all of the Orient, all of the in-between, the Middle East, all of Europe, all Americas, all South America. They're all still, I feel, going to be represented in this glorious kingdom over which Christ is going to rule. All right, then down to verse 6, and I guess that'll kill this half hour. I, the Lord, have called thee, that is Israel. Isaiah 42, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thy hand, and keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people. For what purpose? To be a light to the Gentiles. Well, now what did God promise Moses back in Exodus 19? That every Jew would become a priest of God. Well, Isaiah is putting it in a little different language, but it's still the same thing. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.